Do you ever feel like maybe we leaders take ourselves too seriously? If you find yourself wound up about a missed detail and then yelling at one of your employees because of it, you need to hear from Steve Cody, my guest today, about the importance of humor. He is the CEO and founder of Peppercom, who's, where humor is a core value of his highly successful and recognized strategic communications firm. He's also co-authoring a book called The ROI of LOL, due out this year. Steve Cody, welcome to How I Turned the Corner. Thank you, Kendra. I'm still turning that corner, but I do appreciate the opportunity to meet and speak with you. Excellent. Well, I'd love to start with this idea of humor. Why do you think this is so important in today's leadership? Uh, all we have to do is look at the news and what's going on in the world around us. And it's it's negativity, it's divisiveness, it's literally neighbors, unfortunately, you know, shooting other neighbors. So we live in a very, very negative society. So it's critical. I mean, there are countless surveys out that show that when consumers slash employees are surveyed about the only ones they trust um, or have any trust left in are their leaders. So if the leaders aren't empathetic, self-deprecating, vulnerable, sharing their faults, foibles, mistakes, et cetera, it can make a bad situation even worse for those employees. So I think, I think it's fundamentally more important to inject humor and laughter in the culture in the right way, at the right time, and at the right place. Mm -hmm. So how has it benefited you at, at Peppercom? It's um it's been a game changer, a differentiator. And I stumbled across it. I'll, I'll make it very quick. But I had a bunch of bucket list items when I turned 40, climbing mountains and performing stand up and a few other crazy things. And I thought stand up was a one and done. Um, and I did it. Uh, the MC made the mistake of telling me he thought he was I was pretty funny and he had his own show. Would I like to perform? I immediately thought I'd be on, you know, late night, um, you know, Conan, et cetera. Uh, what I did with two straight years, I performed two or three nights a week because it was like a drug. I just absolutely adored it. I never became more than a mediocre comedian. And my my professional and personal motto to this day remains expect less. But what I found was that the skills that I was um, learning as a stand-up comedian were immediately transferable to the business world. And I found myself becoming uh, a much better listener, much more relaxed in terms of presentations, and critically, really being open about my vulnerability. Because comedians, my, my, my coach, my comedy coach says, comedians are people with an issue or a problem. And that's, that's what best comedians do. They storytell. So I also learned all sorts of new ways in which to show my vulnerability and to bring self-deprecating humor into my workplace. And I said, this is working for me. I think it could work for our entire agency. So long story made short, since 2010, 2011, every single one of our employees have been, have been trained in stand-up and multiple forms of improvisational comedy. And it's been a huge differentiator for us in terms of winning great workplace awards, winning clients, serving as a screen for both uh, recruiting people and also for clients. We, with the prospective clients and prospective employees, they either immediately get us and like our culture and vice versa or not. So it's really enabled us to differentiate. And um, and we've also tied it into our charitable fundraising. Every year, we the employees pick out a different charity. I am C very poorly. They see me <laughs> fail. And then each one of them will do three or four minutes, not each one, but 10 or 11 will do. And we'll raise five, 10, $15,000 for a different charity. So it's a huge differentiator for us. Oh, I love that so much. I've always said, and I kind of said this in a, in a way where I felt maybe a little shame with it, but now you're making me feel maybe some pride in it. But I've always thought like, I don't really like the, the type A personality that most CEs, CEOs have. And I've always said about myself that I'm more of a type B CEO, where I just don't take myself so seriously. And I think my staff is always a little shocked, especially new employees, when I'll say things like, nobody's going to die because of that bad proposal or that number that wasn't perfect or the spelling error, or, I mean, sometimes even major mistakes. And it's like, nobody's going to die. Like we don't have to take this so seriously. 
I know that there are some businesses where that is, you know, the case where somebody or people could die, but for the majority of businesses, we just take ourselves so, so seriously. And it just makes, I think for all this pain as well. And so when I say that, I mean, what's your reaction to that? I completely agree. And it's, it's rampant in my, in my profession, public relations. Oh yeah. Uh, many leaders think that they're, you know, ending world hunger or curing cancer. They may be helping the communications of organizations that are doing that, but we're not, we're, we're doing marketing and branding and we're helping with reputation management, but come on guys, we're not ending world hunger. We're not curing cancer. So don't take yourself too seriously. Take the work you do very seriously, but come on, lighten up. And, and and I find that if you lighten up, one of the things that I do is I typically, we're on teams and we have, you know, in-person meetings, both remote and virtual. And I will introduce an idea by saying, I know you guys are either going to ignore or delete this, but I think we should do such and such. And they've been trained to the point where they'll say, yes, and Steve, interesting idea, but I think we can go in this direction. So we've learned how not to say that's a terrible idea or geez, that's awful, but we build on each other's ideas. So I let them know it's okay because I am I am so open about admitting my mistakes and talking about all my problems. And especially during the pandemic, I was very transparent about not knowing what the future would hold, about not knowing what our clients would do, about not knowing if there would be pay cuts or, or downsizings. But I promised that I would communicate each and every day with them. And that's what I did. And that's what I continue to do. And the pandemic actually turned out I don't know if I want to use this phrase, but a blessing for us because I've never been closer to our employees. And we have 50 or more of them all over the country. Half, half, you know, half do come into the city for the for the in-person meetings on Thursday, but the rest are remote. But I know them so well now because we shared so much of what we went through that, you know, I hate the, and I know the word family is actually being canceled in the business world. But I, we are just so we are so tight. And in the last three years, we've had less than 10 percent turnover. And I think those 10 percent just went out for lunch and got lost and they'll eventually find their way back to the office. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I want to come back to what you said a minute ago and just teach our listeners about improv. Um, I have a, I was actually grew up on the stage. I started performing when I was two and I actually tried to make it on Broadway when I was 17, didn't make it, but so I've done a lot of improv in my life. And, um, can you just tell our listeners the rules of improv? Cause you used one of them a minute ago, the, the yes. And what are the other rules just so, and how we could bring, bring that into business and how you brought it into business? Yeah, sure. I studied at, uh, the upright citizens brigade, which was an amazing experience. And I performed in various improv troops. Improv is much more difficult to perform, as you know, than stand-up. Stand-up is basically just memorizing your story and, and reading the audience, et cetera. But, but there are various forms of improv. So the yes end exercise is simply stating a word or a phrase, and it's all that active listening. So you get a group of five or six people together, and I'll say something like, I went to school at Northeastern University in Boston. And the person next to me will say, yes, and Boston is one of my all-time favorite places to bring my family. And the next person will say, yes, and my family and I like to go on cruises instead. And the next person will say, yes, and I was on a cruise ship that took me to Hawaii in the last year. So you listen for one word and you build and you complete, you can continue the story and it will come back to me. And I'll try to figure out some way to use Boston or Northeastern University so that it goes full circle. So what it does is it frees the mind, it forces you to become a team and to work together to complete each other's thoughts. And that in turn will lead to better brainstorming, better ideation, better team uh, teamwork, et cetera. There are many other things we do. We have teams uh, break into groups and come up with a fictitious product, come up with a name, come up with the problem it's solving, who would be the spokesperson and how would you uh, uh, launch the campaign? We give them five minutes and they come up with outrageously funny, creative things to launch this fictitious product. And then we say, OK, we're working with client X right now. Let's bring that same thinking to the client uh, assignment. Um, and then we'll also have the one word game where I will just start with um, Aquafina and the, you'll come up with butterfly and I'm, it, somehow because you have a butterfly behind you somehow right. we'll work together to create a coherent story by using one word and there'll be 30 or 40 of us just doing rapid fire and we'll keep doing it until we get a really coherent story that's great I love that 
Yeah, that's a great use. I, I've been encouraging some of my clients to bring improv in as a, just a, a team building activity. So I think that's that's great that, you know, thank you for that education for our listeners. <laughs> of course. I also want to talk about what you said too, about the family and, and the kind of canceling around that word. And I actually have personally struggled with that myself as a leader and that I don't, I've never been able to really wrap my arms around my staff as family, but, um, I've, what I've, I've used the word I use now is community. And mm-hmm. I never thought of business as a place that builds community before, but we've had uh, a number of things over the years where we've been able to rally around each other, like a community, even former employees. Um, one of my former employees lost her home in the, that awful fire we had here in Colorado. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, I don't know if you heard about that, but it like swept through just like a normal, just neighborhood wasn't even near the mountains and burned about a thousand houses to the ground. And anyway, she lost her home. She hasn't worked for me in, I don't know, five or six years. And we did a GoFundMe account for her. And it was my customers that contributed to her GoFundMe, people that she used to support. I mean, it was amazing. And that was like my first time in my, in my kind of leadership when I realized business is a community. And so I don't know if that word resonates with you, but it, it completely resonates. And um, because we are so close to each other within, you know, and there are boundaries, obviously, that are set. But, you know, if someone has lost a pet, we are very pet friendly and Peppercom is named in honor of my late black lab. So everyone shares their stories about their cats or their dogs or whatever. And when someone loses, you know, a, a pet, it's like losing a family member and the community will rally around him or her. And, you know, we'll grieve with the person who lost, you know, Puffy or whatever. I mean, it's a shared, it's a shared feeling and it's really something that never existed before. And it's also extended to our clients Um, because our people are so immersed in the nuances of stand up and improv. They know how to read our clients and develop those relationships and take those relationships into more of a community type of engagement. So now we know when a lot of our clients are having personal issues or family issues. And so we'll be supporting clients and vice versa in the same way yours did with that GoFundMe page. So those are the kinds of, of, um, of outcomes. Um, the rapport, the deepening of the relationship is a direct outcome of the comedy and the humor training. Mm. Mm, that's great. Well, so so I also saw on your website on your career page uh, which, by the way, I love, love the way you guys talk about your culture. Um, I also saw there that you talked about your career conversations being a yearly conversation, meaning going on all year, which is another trend that I just cannot stand about my field, HR, of the yearly performance review, where you get feedback once a year and you get you know, an annual raise. It sounds like you guys are doing that differently. We we are always trying to do things differently. Can you can you tell me a little bit about about that for your team? Yeah, we have all sorts of of, of mentoring and um, colleague uh, partnerships that we create within the organization. So you are not only just reporting to Jane or John, you have a relationship with Jim or Janelle, um, and they'll be more of your buddies on the personal side as opposed to the professional side. And we'll have check-ins. Um, you know, John will check in with Jane or vice versa on the business path. And then separately, we'll have you know personal situations there where you have a buddy that you're comfortable with. And this also, we have a complete HR function. So if there's an HR need, you would go to HR. But we have a lot of support systems in place that we make sure there are check-ins at least every two weeks, if not on a monthly basis, but more often as is needed. And obviously in the past couple of years, there have been some people who've had very serious emotional trauma that they've had to deal with. So in those instances, it's a day-by-day proposition where we try to help him or her get through the situation. And if they need to take time off, no problem whatsoever. So we're very sensitive to um, both the professional Um, career path and whether, you know, he or she is making it. And we'll be very honest, by the way, we also, obviously, no organization is perfect. And an individual's, you know, personal goals and purpose may not be aligned with the organization. So there are also times, Kendra, when it's clearly not working out for an individual, and it's not working out for Peppercom, and it's not fair to the individual's teamwork that he or she is not performing and they have to work harder. So we'll have those difficult conversations at the same time. We're we're not afraid to have the difficult conversations. And again, I think it's because 
we do have that that comedy and humor training in which everyone's been through this together. It's almost like we've been through multiple battles and wars together. So we can be very un, uh, open and if necessary, blunt and honest with each other if things aren't working out. But I agree with you. Waiting, you know, 365 days to sit down. I mean, 365 days is is like a decade now. I mean, things change on a daily or weekly basis. So constant check-ins are, the, are the, for me, they're the currency of the realm. It's the only way to run an organization. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. And, you know, what? I guess I have the the liberty of being able to be kind of a Petri dish for a lot of the things that my field does or doesn't do. And so we try to, ex- we experiment with a lot of different models and a lot of different uh, I mean, we riff on a lot of ideas and say, does this work or does this not work? And the performance management one is the one we're on right now. If, you know, how do we just have this be more of a, a conversation that's ongoing as opposed to just this like stake in the ground? So I really appreciate your your thoughts on that. Um, yeah. And, and also, Kendra, just before yeah. you go on, we also try to shine the spotlight, as I'm sure you do. Uh, not not to um, uh, belittle or leave out anyone who's not, you know, hitting the ball out of the park. But when we have the overachievers, we reward them and we let the others know that they're getting a spot bonus. We have various quarterly um, uh, bonuses that um, the senior management will vote for, not me, but the other senior managers that we call the PEP Leader Awards. And that person will get a check for a certain amount and also a check for his or her charity of choice. And then we also have an award for my late executive assistant who unfortunately passed away from lung cancer. And we give a very big award to the person who best uh, personifies her attributes. And the entire agency will vote on that. And that person will get $500 and $500 for his or her charity. So we're very much about shining the spotlight on those who are going above and beyond. So we're very much a meritocracy, but you know, we also want everyone to know that you know, John's doing really well. Jane's doing really well. You should be doing, you should want to aspire to do the same thing. Or maybe there's a different field that you want to. We've lost people to landscape architecture. I mean, you know, every right. now and then you find out public relations just isn't right for you. So it's, you know, it's it's a it's very important to weed out those who really have it, the passion in their blood, and those who don't. Because those who don't, it's just, it, life's too short. Yeah. 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 I like that too. I, uh, I really, I've created a lot of people out of my team that have moved on to like bigger and better things. And I've had some people again, almost wanting to, you know, call, call me out for some, for shame on that because I've, I've lost people. I shouldn't have turnover in my field, but it's like the best turnover in the world. Right. Absolutely. I am beyond proud of so many people who've gone on to what, as you would say, bigger and better things. Some are really serious players in corporate America. Uh, Others have started their own firms and are very successful. And we bring some of them back on to our podcasts and ask them, what role did comedy and humor have in making you you a more empathetic leader, help you in dealing with tense situations, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm thrilled that we can hire people, they can benefit from their experience at Peppercom and then go on and do other things. Uh-huh. Yeah, I feel the same way. Um, so so let's talk for a minute about your book, the the ROI of LOL. Yeah, um, it's, it's one of those rare occurrences where the publisher found us. So um, we, nice. we obviously, yeah, we obviously publicize the fact that we do provide humor and comedy training to businesses. And we got the call from HarperCollins and they said, this is fascinating. We haven't seen uh, books about comedy written, co-written by a business executive and a professional comedian, which is how we lead all of our comedy and improv sessions. We have three or four different academics, professional comedians who combine with myself or one of our other senior executives. So we like to say we play at the intersection of comedy and business and how what every comedian knows, every business executive should learn. So that's really the 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 um, the nutshell, if you will, of the book. The book is all about why laughter is so important in business, how leaders can become more empathetic, vulnerable, self-deprecating leaders, how it can inform the culture, a lot of case studies. And then we also have the last section is a how to do it yourself for small business owners who obviously couldn't hire, couldn't afford to hire a Peppercom 
um, to come in and do that kind of training. So there's also going to be how to do it yourself, which I think is critically important for startups, entrepreneurs, et cetera. So um, it should run the gamut. It's going to be both print, audio, and digital. And the, the audio will have, believe it or not, um, some uh, some of my presentations, some of my performances. You'll get to hear me bomb at the West Side Comedy Club on the <laughs> audio book. So it should, and we've got some great people from, from the outside of Peppercom world. We have Linda Rutherford, the CAO and CCO of Southwest Airlines. She's writing the forward. We have the CCO of Accenture, the CCO of Dole. We have all these people talking about how laughter and humor have made them better leaders. So it's not Peppercom talking about Peppercom. It's Peppercom and a whole bunch of business leaders sharing their stories on how and why they use humor in the workplace and how it's made them a better leader. Oh, so great. Oh, that's wonderful. When does it come out? Right after Labor Day. Ah, nice. Right after I'm going to be Day. watching for that. Yeah, I'll be going down to the Oval Office and doing a book signing. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> That's a place where we need a lot more humor, is in government. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. The entire capital area needs some humor. <laughs> so, is that why you don't vote on the bonuses? Why? Why do you? Ex why do you exclude yourself from those? I, spot I, yeah, that's a great question. I uh, I feel I am not the smartest person in the room. I feel that um, I try um, to delegate as much decision making as possible. So if I'm asked for my opinion on a particular person getting a raise or a promotion, I'll say, yes, you know, I, I think they're doing a great job, but I don't have the line of sight that their direct managers have on their day-to-day -day performance, uh, their personal health and well-being. So, so pretty much with the exception of the most senior people, um, I will not get that involved. I'll, I'll sign off from a financial standpoint because I have that fiduciary responsibility in terms of what the actual amount is. But if my my managers, middle and senior managers feel that an individual deserves X and should also be promoted, I'm fine with that. Mm -hmm. I never second guess it. I feel they they know what's in the, the firm's best interest. They know what's in the best interest of our clients. And they know if our people do or do not deserve significant bonuses, raises, and promotions. So I depend on them to make all of those decisions. Hmm. So what were you like when you were a new leader 27 years ago or however many years ago when you first founded Peppercom? A deer in the headlights. <laughs> I was a deer in the headlights because I'd spent 25 years prior to that working at big global agencies where I always had, you know, incredible teams. And because I was at Hill and Olten or J. Walter Thompson, when I called people, they returned my calls because they respected those two brand names. When all of a sudden I was Steve Cody with Peppercom, nobody returned my call. So I had to quickly scramble and figure out, okay, how do I get the world to even know that I exist or my firm exists? So, so I went out to the big agency CEOs who I knew and I said, look, you know, I'm just starting out. I'm not a threat. I know you get a lot of new business leads that are probably too small. Will you keep me in mind? They didn't. I got a lot of business that way. I made it my business to go to all the trade editors and say, hey, I'm starting this. Can I get a little publicity? They all publicized me. And then the real luck was the name Peppercom, which I just named after my dog, not knowing that there was this huge dot com you know, surge in the technology sector. And all these deeply funded dot-com firms just assumed Peppercom was a dot-com technology specialist. And we weren't, we were B2B financial services, but we were getting 40 new business calls a week. So I immediately said, I'm going to hire, so I'm going to hire technology people and we're going to start publicizing this dot-com thing. So we grew rapidly. And I, that's how I really started to learn. And then I also started to learn how to handle failure because when the dot-com bubble burst, all of a sudden, almost 50% of our business disappeared in a week. And mm -hmm. I had to lay off 26 people, which was one of the worst days of my life mm -hmm. and completely reposition and uh, Peppercom as going back to our corporate B2B roots. We still had some blue chip clients, but um, I was very much you know, learning my way. I didn't know how to... Um, you know, be an entrepreneurial leader. That's something that, um, you know, I've just um, eventually, you know, eased into, and I'm still trying to learn every single day. I don't take anything for granted. And, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm huge into continuous learning, trying to find new and different things, new and different ways people are leading, new and different campaigns from around the world. 
I know I can do better. And I know it's my responsibility to do the best possible work for my clients. So I must be insatiable. And happily, I have that curiosity in my DNA. Mm. I love that so much, Steve. Well, I think that's a perfect way to end this lovely conversation with you. So we are going to check back in with you in September to find out how it's going with your book. Make sure that we are doing what our, our best to help get the word out about that wonderful book too. So if any of our listeners wants more information about that, please reach out through the YouTube link there or the, the story chat, the story link too, in terms of uh, where we can get this amazing book. Steve, thank you so much for joining me today on how I turned the corner. Kendra, it was my pleasure. I could have gone on with you for another hour or two. <laughs> yes, well, we'll, we'll, we'll continue. <laughs> Fair enough.